trans people have been going to the bathroom, yeah. whichever bathroom matches their gender identity, by the way, they've not had to show any kind of certificate at the door for more than a decade. And we've suddenly got this kind of hysteria around the what ifs. And it's like, it's you don't useless. even have to imagine what if, because this has been happening and trans people have just been minding their own business for that period of time. I yeah. think that we're fine. <laughs> Welcome back to part three of this episode of Impolite Company. We'll pick up where we left off our conversation about gender, talking about unintentional transphobia and the lack of knowledge that exists in unexpected places. I recount the story of a challenging conversation I had with a friend, which actually ended up making our friendship stronger. How reducing women to biology is fraught with issues and rarely holds up to the reality that even cis women can fall outside of some of the normative ideas of what a woman is. We talk about bathrooms, the location at the centre of many trans conversations right now. We also discuss if it's our job to dismantle normative models or if the expectation is for trans people to fit into the models. The existence of intersex people who often get lost in the conversation is also something we talk about. And finally, we chat about allyship in the workplace, asking the question of how you use your power for good. Another really interesting conversation. Enjoy. the focus has been on comprehension, not compassion. Mm. So people will say, I don't understand. Why do you need to understand me in order to say that I, sh- I shouldn't be experiencing violence? Mm. Like right. that, that equation we need to really interrogate. Like what lack of empathy is there in that statement to be like, I just don't get it. What I don't get it becomes a shield for saying, I'm okay with you being exposed to violence. Wow. Mm-hmm. So we need to name that bluff out loud. It's never been about comprehension. It's been about compassion. Because here's the thing. You suddenly have the time to learn the things that you prioritize. But when it comes to gender nonconforming people, it's, I don't really have the time that takes too much time. You don't have the compassion. Let's be honest about it. It's like when people get upset, they say there's so many new words that are being created around gender and sexuality. Why weren't you taking a more public stance on the Oxford comma? You didn't care about grammar then. You only care grammar when it comes about they, them pronouns. That's actually your shield that you're not actually naming. I'm uncomfortable with seeding ground. That's what this is about. I'm uncomfortable because I feel like I have a monopoly in culture. And if anyone else who looks different than me or thinks different than me belongs, then it's at zero. So I'm thinking that means I must go. Mm. But what I want to offer the world is that there's enough space for all of us. You're operating in a fishbowl, but this is a world yeah. and this is a universe. And in fact, in my universe, when you step into your power, that just encourages me to step in mine. Mm. And that's not a conflict. So the ways that trans rights gets positioned is if it's seen as an antagonistic force against tradition, against culture, that mentality break out of it. It actually trans rights accelerate freedom for all mm-hmm. people. Yeah, that's right. And trans rights mm-hmm. fundamentally actually are gonna help men. <laughs> Because men are going to actually be able to develop their own understandings of what manhood means to them. So I wanted to ask you, yeah. off the back of that clip, well, firstly, how far that resonated with you as a man and yeah. as a queer man and how, what your experience has been like with this concept of the gender binary as a queer man, but but I suppose as a queer man who we've spoken about before kind of is straight presenting yeah to a lot of people yeah so i think it kind of relates similar to what i was saying before when you asked me about what my understanding of like the gender conversation let's just use an umbrella term the trans conversation um i i really for me personally also being in that kind of like I said before, that that intersection of being black, gay, um, or queer, it means that what I mean, it can go the other way, but it feels like I have a lot of built in compassion, and it's not necessarily about my space being being really fun. Being, it's not about me worrying about my space uh, being impeded. I don't ever think that actually there has been a massive amount of space that I had to protect, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, or never felt that way anyway. 
I think it's tricky to have where I have found it most tricky to navigate is when and it happened the first time, like maybe about five years ago, where some of this kind of trans uh, extrusion, exclusionary rhetoric was coming up with people that identified as feminists or that are feminists. Um, well, I would argue that you're not a feminist if yeah. you're a trans exclusionary yeah. radical feminist or whatever the fuck. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> So, your feminist excludes it has to have exclusionary in the title then yeah. it, it, as far as i'm concerned it's not feminism but yeah. to, to be honest it hit me like a ton of bricks when it happened i remember i can, I can remember it like the back of my hand um someone said something that was essentially questioning a trans person's behavior and the fact that they weren't that don't pretend to be something that you're not when I'm the real thing and like oh. like yeah so and and it, that kind of hit me like a ton of bricks and it wasn't even a thing that I I don't think it was I don't think it was said in malice it was said more in ignorance so when it happened I was like whoa like it hit me first and then I was like okay I was like how do I have this conversation as a gay man a gay black man um mm, you don't want to mansplain to the wanna, woman yeah i don't want to mansplain but also is it my place um do i fully understand what they're saying it feels it it feels a certain way to me which may be triggering certain things for me because like i said before i i've seen similar narratives play out we had a conversation in that moment and we'd had a couple of drinks so it wasn't like it was everyone was clear-headed mm. um and i I've, I've had this conversation a few times and i've had it with a family member as well where i i guess maybe pulled from my kind of work in user experience and having to be very empathic but <laughs> challenged the thoughts with kind of logical external kind of i'm looking at this from the outside in i think in that particular case that i talk about i was like why would we focus on this one thing when there's so much of both lived experiences that are so similar why would we not and and, and we'll face similar things as either a trans woman or a <laughs> cis woman why would we focus on a very small part why would we put so much energy into that and why would it, why does that impede on your space? Well, one of the things that that immediately occurred to me as you were saying that is how I think when cis women respond in that way, mm. we reduce ourselves to our biological functions. So we begin to define, if I'm Sorry. a real woman, yeah. real woman in inverted commas, because I can have children mm. or because I have a vagina that was like what, you know, whatever the, the, the definition is. Yes. That's trans exclusionary in and of itself by saying I'm real and you're not. Yeah. And, and bigoted, but also I'm interested in the fact that it's harmful to women because to cisgender women, because it's then reducing women to their biology to their ability to have children yeah. to whether or not they menstruate i know that there's so much like kind of online like oh women are being erased because now they're being referred to as people who menstruate and it's like no some women can't menstruate so yeah. <laughs> so in order to be it's the not just about <laughs> yeah it's not just about trans inclusion yeah. it's about inclusion of women yeah beyond the concept of whether yeah. or not they have periods. Yeah. And I think that we feed into really patriarchal notions of what womanhood yes. is when we say, I'm a woman and you're not because yeah. what? Because I'm so interested in, you know, there was that kind of ongoing period of time in the media where any remotely um, trans inclusive politician or whatever would be asked like, can a woman have a penis? You know, that was like yeah. the, that was like the gotcha question, yeah. which feeds back into what we were saying earlier, right? About, yeah. about the discourse over the past few years yeah. being really lacking in any kind of nuance. And it's yeah. like, that's the gotcha question. Cause if you say yes, like 
fuck you and yeah, <laughs> if yeah. you say no it's like there's no way to have a to give a balanced answer to yeah. that and if you try and give a balanced answer to that it's like it's taking too long and, and you're trying to fudge the question in some way yeah but i'm always I, I what i would love to see is somebody ask that question to a transphobic person mm. ask that question to jk rowling describe a woman because you know the the, de the definition of woman question always gets asked yeah. to people who believe in trans rights right yeah. but but people who don't i'd be interested in their definition because yeah. because these things are knotty and complicated, complicated and difficult even even sex versus gender is complicated so how do you define woman well it's partly it's it's my identity it's my gender identity yeah. if i suddenly found out tomorrow which isn't outside of the realms of possibility mm. that i had xy chromosomes mm. right which is possible mm. i wouldn't suddenly be like right well i i guess i'm a man yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. my identity wouldn't suddenly change right even when you're mm. talking about the messiness of biology which which is another thing that likes to be kind of cited yeah. science is very clear on this it's yeah. like Science no, is really not clear not, on this. No, it's really well documented. It's, not, so. <laughs> it's just really not. So and so, <laughs> you know, women can have children and be have XY chromosomes. Some women have have um, ovaries and have XY chromosomes. XY yeah. and XX aren't the only chromosome. You know, there's all of these intersex people exist, yeah. right? We never talk about the fact that intersex people exist, but but they're not even recognised legally. Mm. I I looked into this for some for some research I was doing. And you cannot register an intersex child, as far as I'm aware, and I've looked into this, in the UK, you have to put the, if you have a baby that is intersex in any way, you have to put male or female on the birth certificate. So then the person doesn't get any say. It's well, the person doesn't get any say. Often also what happens is the, the there's a medical uh, early medicalization. So either there's like childhood surgeries or the parents have to kind of, decide which gender this baby is or this child is going to be and then what if their gender identity doesn't match that and they've yeah. already had surgery i think another interesting thing that is often even, sorry just to, sorry to interrupt but even if physically they start to develop in a different yeah. way to the surgery they've had for example well you mean you could leave then? them alone and not give them surgery but i think yeah. that because of the gender binary but, there's a lot of pressure to yeah. like like pick a side as yeah. parents like pick, but what pick I mean a gender is like you then put that person down you've taken that person down a route that is so hard to reverse if they need to or change it's so sad but what's interesting is that terminology of you've taken them down a route that is so hard to change mm. is often the kind of terminology that transphobes use about trans kids being able to let's say go on puberty blockers or or whatever yeah. and in that case you're talking about something that's chosen by the individual yeah based exactly. on their deeply it's, held it's, sense of of their own identity yeah. and and is reversible right yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah but nobody talks about the fact that that you can just put your intersex child into surgery against their will uh you know and it so seems okay. that's where's where are the kind of you know if if transphobes are so feel so strongly about the medicalization of children i'd love to know where they stand <laughs> on the fact that intersex children are being are uh, going through surgery it feels regressive it feels like in the times where it was okay to have like a back alley abortion because that was more normal than having a child out of wedlock it's like what are you talking about like like do you know what i mean like in it, it that is you're you're putting someone in a situation that is so dangerous psychologically or physically mm -hmm. but that being okay because that's that goes with that narrative right of like well you would you wouldn't want to have a, like a child out of wedlock so i call it back alley abortion it is it's like yeah and that was like a normal thing that, like that narrative it just reminds me of, it just feels like such regressive like a regressive way of thinking it is it is like so but i think it speaks to the fact that we can't the gender binary as it is is so prevalent in society as a social structure yeah. that it leaves no room for anything that exists outside of it. Yeah. And that's not just to do with people's deeply held sense of their own identity or their kind of socialization, yeah. but it also relates to people who fall outside of it, like biologically fall yeah. outside of it. Yeah. And 
you know, the more you look into this stuff, the more you realize that intersex people have always existed, trans people have always existed, gay people have always existed. The gender binary is the thing that hasn't always existed. Yeah, that's, <laughs> you know? the new, that's the new player. And so when people are kind of like, well, what are we going to do about toilets? It's like, yeah. well, we decided that there'd be a man's toilet and a women's toilet and that, yeah. that that was the structure. We could decide to change that structure. Yeah. You know, so the, the, the owner shouldn't be on trans people to work out which bathroom to go to yeah. that will please everyone which there's no good answer to right. the question should be why do we have this binary system and is it inclusive and actually you know on the toilet topic having gender inclusive toilets by the way doesn't isn't just good for trans people it's good for loads of different people yeah. it's good for mothers who want to take their son into the toilet with them yeah. but don't want to take them into the women you know there's all yeah. kinds of reasons that being inclusive is good for all of us but yeah. it gets reduced into it's like it's it's trans people's job to work out how they should fit into the binary models that we've yeah. got rather than our job to dismantle those yeah. models and like you said before it's always on those those debates always happen on the backdrop of some kind of extreme example yes that's so like but what if well, what if i walked out of here and a crazed bus driver decided he was going to run everyone down like it's a very the, the chances are so low but also <laughs> i think it's worth pointing out just just in relation to bathrooms yeah. that trans people have the legal right to use the bathroom associated yeah. with their gender identity and they have had that legal right since i think 2010 yeah, it's been a long time so we trans people have been going to the bathroom yeah. Whichever bathroom matches their gender identity, by the way, they've not had to show any kind of certificate at the door for more than a decade. And we've suddenly got this kind of hysteria around the what ifs. And it's like, it's we don't useless. even have to imagine what if because this has been happening and trans people have just been minding their own business for that period of time. I yeah. think that we're fine. It's being used as a very divisive thing. It's, 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 it's being used and the narrative around it is being used to, to create this type of like divisive conversation and i think that it's 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 sad to see because actually it's not gonna in the longer term it's not going to benefit cis women or trans women if we continue down this direction or anyone anyone anybody that's from marginalized and that's the thing right that's the point yeah i think it's not gonna it's it, it, it's all systems of oppression are linked. I don't think you can say, well, I'm transphobic, but I'm, all, I'm all okay with the rest of the gays, yeah. or I'm not racist. They, they're all linked, yeah. right? Like, like and, and once you start down the rabbit hole, you really can't compartmentalize. You know, if you think yeah. about the, the Olympic bans for trans women yeah. that have just come into yeah. force in the last couple of days, you know, it's worth noting that, again, as far as I'm aware, there are no trans women competing at that level right now anyway. So this is a, this is a kind of invented problem, yeah. number one. And number two, the new rules do impact a lot of women, black women, yeah. world record holders. So you have a situation over the past few years where a load of white women athletes have been kicking off about the fact that black women have been beating them in <laughs> by miles in mm. some of these, you know, running races in particular. Casta Semenya is, is an example. Yeah. Um, Casta Semenya is a cisgender woman. Granted, she has um, she's intersex, and she's now effectively been banned. You know, and I, there's loads of talk about biological advantage and all of that kind of stuff. But it's total bullshit. Michael Phelps has loads of biological oh, yeah. advantages <laughs> that make yeah. him an amazing swimmer yeah. because of just the fluke of biology. Yeah. Sport is often about flukes of biology. Why? Why do six foot eleven? people play basketball yeah. because they're tall. Yeah. <laughs> they have but, a biological but, advantage of playing that sport. But again, what it's been reduced down to is, well, I'm going to be keep competing against men because there's not a recognition that that person, that there is any, that there's anything more than the two binary genders. And well, that, and, and there, I think sometimes the way the argument is put forward is almost like without maybe not even saying it, well, then I'm going to be competing against men. Like, whoa. but also then the implicit thing mm. is okay. Let's let's ban transgender women, right? Even though 
that's not a, that's not a problem that we've currently got at, in elite sports, right? Let's ban transgender women, but by using a transphobic de definition of womanhood, we start hurting other women. Yeah. So other women who have high levels of testosterone yeah. or whatever, you know, where do the lines end on what we define woman to be? Yeah. And so this is where I think this really starts to this really hurts us all is by defining women according to hormone levels, according to ability to have children, according to, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever rudimentary biological functions we use to define women, we don't only go into transphobia, we go into racism, we go, you know, yeah. we <laughs> it sends into absolute, you, we go into homophobia, you bigotry. know, um, <laughs> Ruth Hunt, who came and spoke to us, you know, at, for a talk at both of our last company, mm -hmm spoke about she she's a um lesbian woman spoke about how she doesn't she's scared to use women's toilets now mm -hmm. because she as a woman with short hair um who's quite kind of re relatively mask presenting woman gets questioned and interrogated by women in the toilet she's not a trans woman mm -hmm. but you see how the creeping yeah. bigotry <laughs> impacts um all of us and i think this is part of of why we should care so deeply about about this is it's not just poor trans people they're being yeah. they're, they're you know they're a vulnerable group who are being absolutely monstered at the moment but also it's about all of us and like it's about what kind of world we want to live in and how we want to be defined yeah i think it's so true and it is possible to just to tie up tie off the story i was speaking about earlier it is possible to have a constructive conversation around that and I did with my friend and from my understanding, and they've mentioned it a few times, they were like, when we had that conversation, it, it, it caused me to pause mm -hmm. and think about what I was saying and the message I was, I was, uh, what I was prescribing to and why I thought that way. And that person thanked me. And I, you know, I don't know what it's like to be a woman. I don't know what it's like to be a trans woman. I think as a man, and, and I think I have the privilege of, like I said, being in those different intersections, there's a way in which I guess we can talk about things mm -hmm. in a way that will help it be more relatable to people. Because especially when you're a person of color, and, and if you're gay as well, you're having to do that all the time. You're having to, you're, it's, I think it's naturally built in for you to be more empathic. Mm -hmm. It would be, it would be interesting to understand someone that wasn't and didn't, and didn't cross those intersections and haven't, hasn't got either trauma attached or something attached to some of those things where you're just more able to comprehend what those, what's going on and how that, how that could escalate in some of that issue that it, that it doesn't really need to. So I think it's really important to know that it's okay. And we should be normalizing having those conversations because it's the nuances that matter and how you have to have those conversations to be able to discuss those nuances and move away from us talking about things in like this kind of binary extreme way is where i think we start, start to see problems and it's i mean no pun intended but it's where we start to see see the problems in it becomes more about what you were saying before about one-upmanship rather than how do we solve this mm. so but i also think that there's a, there is this question and again it's an ongoing question for me is who do you engage you know yeah. um ruth hunt again gave a great speech an oxford union speech that's on youtube yeah and one, she broke down some of this stuff really clearly and was kind of like, you know, if you're talking to somebody who's biological essentialist, basically, like, yeah. there's no point having the conversation. Like, like, mm. like, it's just so extreme that you're going to waste time arguing with that person. And people who are ignorant and defensive or, whatever, you know, th there are, I th there are conversations worth having and there is nuance, but I do, I do think it's worth I think about this a lot with racism. Yeah. How much do I want to engage with a with a race racist? I think it's it's a sliding scale based on on how bad faith that that racism yeah. is, and That's how true. and you know is it does is this conversation designed to exhaust me and put yeah. me on the back foot and make me defend my identity as a yeah. person of color? Or react. Or yeah, yeah, <laughs> because because the burden is always on you yeah. to to make the case. So. I do also think that's something to to think consider as well. Yeah, completely agree. I think, and I think that's that's the the challenge, right? It's knowing how to use your energy in the best way or have the most productive conversations. There are going to be, 
and I, and I think we do this all the time, like in every day at work, right? Like I, yeah. I, I'm always thinking about strategically how I'm going to deliver a message. And are there some people that are lost causes? Yes, there are. But also, I think that the the powerful thing about that that story with your friend is, mm -hmm. you know, you used your relationship with that person you yes. use your proximity to them and, and yes. the the assumption of them as a good person as a good faith you know yeah. and also your power in that situation to speak up for trans people because i yes. think when we think about allyship and solidarity i often think about it as how do you use your power mm -hmm. so in a workplace setting a really if you're senior how are you using that power Never. if yeah. you're a senior woman who's seeing transphobia in your team or something like that you've got power in that yeah. situation, even though you're a woman. And so how our kind of power and privilege is contextualized makes a difference. And I think because trans people are among the most vulnerable and marginalized yeah. in society, and it's not even that taboo to be transphobic, I think that we have a duty as cisgender people, queer or straight or otherwise, like, to speak up yeah. and to put ourselves on the line of it yeah. and to kind of uh, to kind of get uncomfortable about it because yeah. you know as such a small minority trans people don't have a voice in a lot of spaces and don't have the power and privilege to to be able to speak up in a lot of spaces yeah really agree <laughs> i'm just saying here like, <laughs> I'm like yeah yeah <laughs> i'm on my soapbox yeah. today yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no but no yeah no i i i completely agree and i think when you hopefully having more conversations publicly like this which is like part of the reason why we started doing this podcast really hopefully allows people to kind of get into the way that other people think about these things especially people that are within the community and think about the the broader impact it's having because it does have a broader impact where we are all impacted by it whether we we like it or not even if you're not within the lgbtq community as a black person as a person as, as a woman mm. as a you everybody is impacted by this conversation so you can either get behind it because ultimately you have an ulterior reason or motive because it will impact you and you can pretend it won't and, and that's up to you but when it hits you hard that you realize that actually a lot of things are set against you because of the way the, the direction of this conversation is going don't be surprised mm. <laughs> like we have to be honest about these things right yeah um and also there's going to be a nuance there, there are nuances in people's understanding and thinking about it right we're not monolithic and i think that goes back to that whole like it feels weird using the term like binary thinking because it feels like i'm talking about non-binary but i'm not but that whole like extreme thinking Again, and that oversimplification is on the basis that everyone's that it's monolithic, right? And there are parts yeah. of it. There's a general what is what we feel is right and wrong as a society. Um, whether that is actually right or wrong is another thing. But then there's also like talking about the nuances and being accommod and accommodating those nuances. Yes, but there's also a, there's also a part of me that is like, I think this this particular conversation gets overcomplicated and it is fairly simple you know yeah. it's quite simply trans people are people and they deserve rights like everybody else yeah. and often companies will talk to me about like oh you know there are the, there are the obvious things that we're obviously going to do because they're common yeah. sense and that's you know we don't want any racism yeah. we don't want any homophobia but but this whole gender thing and it's like no 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 this isn't this thing over here that's a bit of a debate but yeah. racism is a is a no-brainer like yeah that these things are all this is also in that category it's mm -hmm. pretty simple and I think it overcomplicated as a way to obscure yes. as as well. Agree. Agree. Um, that's been such an interesting conversation. Maybe we need to do another one of these because uh, I've got more to say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Impolite Company. If you like the new format, please let us know. If you didn't, also let us know. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe if you're enjoying the conversation. Until next time, see ya.